Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 46. Today we're going to be talking about abstract games, as always. My name is Mark, here with me is Orion. Hey, what's up? And Matt. Hi, how's it going? And I've told Amber she could hop in at any time, so maybe we'll see her, but she's watching a movie at the moment. Like I said, we're going to be talking about abstract games. I'm going to change something up, though, real quick, before we get into the discussion Watch this, guys. I'm going to try this out. All right. This I'm podcast scared. is brought to us by our awesome Patreon supporters. If you want to help out this podcast and the rest of what The Thoughtful Gamer does, go to patreon.com slash The Thoughtful Gamer. Wow. Hashtag sponsored content. I mean, no, but <laughs> financially supported content by awesome people Yeah, thank, with, with thank no... You. Other Patreon financial supporters. interest in what we do or say, other than that they enjoy what we do and say. Anyways, I don't know, I figured I'd put it at the beginning. We'll see how it works. I feel odd. Like like I've done something wrong. I feel reinvigorated. Oh, really? I think I'll have better thoughts now. You'll be thinking about our patrons and be inspired? Yeah, yeah, that, um, kind of the, you know, the heart, the grit factor, that sort of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. And we have a patron listening, uh, or watching live on our stream, uh, which is a, a benefit of that. Okay, now I'm stopping with this. Abstract Games, which was our theme for January, although it is extending now into the first week of February, and then that should be it. We're, we're done with Abstract Month. We're and never allowed to play chess, or Go, or Santorini, or Tack again. No, we had to throw them all away, burn them, make a nice fire. Although, I will ask... February is two-player games month, right? It's kind of overlapping. I figured and it'd be a good discussion after we're done with February. Many of those abstract games are two-player games. Yes. That's what I'm saying. We could have a nice, like, comparative discussion at the end of it. Okay. All right. Almost uh, like well, you planned this. It, it is almost like I planned it. Nice. But we're taking a huge left turn in, go, into March. Wow. Uh, which I will not, the, the patrons know Get hyped. from the Discord, but March is going to be very different from this if uh, if things go according to plan. But yeah, we've been playing abstract games. A lot of Go, I think that's the one we've most latched onto, although part we've, of the reason we've is We've started that playing it online, very, which is conducive to playing yeah. more. So Yeah, there's a very good online implementation, but I don't yeah, know, is that the one you've enjoyed the most, Matt? It is, It. I mean... Since there's a great website to play it on, it's the one I've had the most chance to play. But I, I suspect that it's the one that I will continue to play in the near future, at least. Yeah, Go is the most, like, baffling one for me. Like, I'm still placing stones, like, 50% of the time, and I really don't know why I'm making the move I'm making. But I feel like <laughs> I'm getting better. It's it's a weird one. I just finished up my review of Tack as uh, right before we recorded this, and I very much enjoyed Tack. I think that one is actually quite good. the The first player advantage nice. issue is difficult, although some of the numbers I, I researched before and it said I saw a number that said sixty five percent of the time the first player wins. But I just did some more research and I'm seeing numbers closer to fifty five, which puts it in line with chess, which isn't as big of a deal. But yeah, we'll be talking about Tack. Chess is the one I'm just horrifically bad at, but it's it's definitely a classic. I know, Orion, you've been watching and playing more chess recently. Yeah, GM Hikaru. Hikaru is awesome. Hikaru we'll have to talk Nakamura. a bit more about him later. But let's start with, with a general topic of what is an abstract game? What do we mean when we say abstract strategy game? And there are a couple ways you can do it. The very literal sense of the phrase is just a themeless game, a game that doesn't have any apparent theme to it. But when you think about what kind of games are classified as abstract, like the quintessential abstract games, chess has a theme. It's not really important, but it kind of has a theme. There are medieval looking pieces. There's a king and queen and knights and, and castles and bishops. That's kind of a theme. I guess. <laughs> I mean, but but the example I thought of was was think of Lost Cities. That kind of has a theme, but not really. It could be anything. Yeah. It doesn't really influence the play. You don't feel like you're exploring with Lost Cities. You don't feel like I'm mean, even more so with chess, I guess you feel like you're kind of attacking and defending some kind of abstract land or something. But you would really classify Lost Cities as an abstract, maybe. Lost Cities 
I guess it's an abstract. I yeah. Don't know. It's so simple, like, and there's almost no positional play or strategy. It's just kind of you draw a card and you play a card. That's interesting because it, it is a card game, and I, we could consider card games. It's also kind of a numbery game. I don't know, like even like Hanabi mm-hmm. has a similar thing with numbered cards. It, um, maybe falls in the same territory as Lost Cities. Yeah, and I guess if you wanted to call them an abstract game, you would. But it's they're certainly not the games you would think of if someone was like think of an abstract game. I don't know. Well, calling we, calling Lost I, Cities an abstract almost feels like an insult to go. Right, right. So what I was thinking of is like what we really mean when we say abstract games are just games that feel like the classic abstract games. Chess, Go, uh, Mancala, which we haven't really played, but is an ancient game. Those are the th- first oh, three I that used came to, to play mind. Mancala. I know there's a Chinese variant on chess that's pretty old. I, I think I, I've played yeah i've played chinese chess it's pretty interesting but i think instead of looking at games that just don't have a theme or have an incredibly weak theme what we in the hobby or what i I think people generally would would say if they've heard of the phrase when they think of an abstract game is just a game that feels like one of those other games now they're often very little theme or no theme at all but i don't think that's necessarily the defining factor of this kind of category of games at least the way we use it, the way we use that phrase, which I found to be yeah, interesting. I, that is interesting. I, I mean, I was look at say, look at card games, it, right? Like poker, right, blackjack, right. trick taking games. Those have no theme at all, but they're just a different type of game. It's 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 one of those interesting things so, of like the heritage of the language. We call them abstracts. So one thing that you haven't mentioned is hidden information um i think don't don't we associate abstracts with a lack of hidden information and and then a corollary there is that card games just by the design of cards tend to have hidden information of some sort yeah i think i think the two reasons why card games aren't ever considered in this category even though they are abstract is that they're played with cards and that they have hidden information. I think those would be the two things because all the classics don't have hidden information. Chess, Go, Mancala, as far as I remember it, everything is completely exposed and out in the open. Yeah, and and so a game like Tack feels like it fits right in with those abstracts. Mm -hmm. The other kind of attributes that seem to follow are that they're two-player games and that they you have one move at a time so you play one move then you move it over to the other player which feel which i think all the abstracts we played are like that yeah i was wondering if you were going to include checkers which i I think counts as a kind of a simpler entry but then from there chinese checkers which actually can be more than two players oh yeah good point yeah I didn't think of that. I thought of checkers, but I didn't really want to mention it just because I don't particularly like it and it's a solve game. Uh, yeah. So it's less interesting to me. I think the biggest points are the no hidden information, the very geometric style of there's not, there's no like resources or, and really all the pieces are the same. They just move differently in chess. Mm-hmm. You know, any piece can take any other piece. It's not like um, a risk army where one army is bigger than another or something. Yeah. Uh, They're also it, very spatial. Yeah, very spatial, geometric, a lot of tempo involved, no hidden information, generally two-player, back and forth, one action, one move at a time. Yeah. I, I had written something down ahead of time, and this may be just kind of rephrases the feeling that you're getting at. I think of an abstract is the tactics and strategy are just laid bare. When you approach the game, the the strategy, the tactics aren't hiding behind any pretenses of theme. They're not hiding behind hidden information. So yeah, again, that's probably just more of my encapsulation of the feeling. It just feels like it's laid bare on the table. Well, you could also say another way of phrasing that would be to say that an attribute of this kind of game is elegance. Yeah, absolutely. Almost it necessarily ties right in. Yeah. yeah, but I think it's interesting. We've had you know we, we we come to these discussions of language and classification and how language evolves and is messy. And I think this is a kind of messy term. 
right? It's It very clearly is using a word that means something in the English language, but only kind of means that in the classification. An abstract game, by most usage, isn't necessarily any game that is abstract. It is a style of game that is similar to these other games. And somewhere along the line, it caught on to call them just abstract games, which is interesting. But let's move on to the games we've been playing. I guess Go is the is the best starting point because that's what we've all been playing. And I've had to, at periodic times like this afternoon, force myself to stop playing Go with you people and other people <laughs> online because I was getting tilted and also not doing my work and making bad plays in Go. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely lost like 5% productivity at work in the last two weeks <laughs> to go. <laughs> it's an absolutely fascinating game. And, you know, it has that reputation, and I've, I've known it for a while, you know, it's more complicated than chess, there are more possible board states. When you think about it, it's not necessarily an indication that it's more strategic, but it feels much more overwhelming to me. And we haven't even been playing on full go like full sized boards. We've been playing much smaller boards, which is for people who want to try this out, definitely the way to start. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. You want to get the, the tactics down or at least some you idea know, of tactics. No, that was first. actually great. Yeah, we played on the nine by nine board for a couple of times. I'm really enjoying the thirteen by thirteen board. I like that one a lot, yeah. Yeah. It, just today I thought to myself, you know, I think I'm ready to start an actual game. But even now, after playing for a few weeks, that's kind of intimidating. But for those who haven't played Go, it is, it's it's colloquially called the surrounding game. It is about surrounding pieces. You don't move pieces in Go, you place them. Uh, they're white and black pieces. The pieces are all the same, and you just alternate placing pieces uh, on the intersections of this grid. And the key part of Go is that each piece has a certain number of liberties, and that means spaces orthogonally adjacent to them that don't have an opponent's piece or don't have any piece that that is a liberty and if you are able to surround a stone or a collection of stones so that of your opponent's stones so that they have no liberties they're removed from the board and they're they're effectively points for your side other than that's basically the rules. There's some other thing. You can't cause the board state to go back to what it was the previous turn. So you can't create an endless loop. And then just different, a couple different subtle ways of scoring based on whether you're, you're using the Chinese or Japanese rules. But you're just trying to capture as much territory as possible. Yeah. And even as you explain that, and, and it should be known that none of us are Go experts by any means. Even, if or you, even as you like explain that. Or even, like, moderately good. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. We're all very bad at Go. We're just <laughs> becoming slightly less bad. <laughs> we're, we're gamers who are trying this and are interested in it. It's not so much about surrounding the opponent's pieces as it is surrounding empty territory, right? Well, it's about creating these structures that can stand. And that is primary. Right, that right. is That is done by giving the structures to what are called two eyes. The idea being that in an eye would just be a, a space that is surrounded by your stones so that if an opponent would go in there, it'd be suicidal. The issue is that if you have a single eye and that is the last space your opponent goes into and eliminates the very last liberty, it still captures all the stones. So for a, a collection of connected stones to be completely secure, they have to have at least two eyes, which means the opponent can never do that final move because it has two suicidal spaces to go into. That's super key. How you create that is completely beyond me, and I'm, I'm having fun kind of slowly working out ways to do that. Even on the 13 by 13 board, it feels almost immense because you have it, – it really – captures this feeling of like zooming in on a specific small battle on a part of the board and then all of a sudden zooming back out to the whole board and considering how it interacts how that little fight interacts with pieces that are already on the board or decisions like when to abandon a particular fight to get yeah. influence on a different part of the board it feels yeah. very epic which is something i wouldn't have expected to say from a game that's so abstract but that that, I, that part I of the game totally is so cool 
the thing that really has struck me as I, I've played is that there is this incredible balance between strategy and tactics. And that's an interesting thing. Kind of all these abstracts that we've played fall somewhere on a spectrum of are they more about the tactics or about the strategy, the grand strategy? But with Go, it's so much about both. And I, I make, when I make winning tactical plays, I'm super excited and I'm still making tactical mistakes. But then at the same time, I'm, I'm still grasping the bigger strategy of not, not only do I want to capture these points on, on the grid, but I want to have influence in wide areas. And so, you know, I'm still making the same sorts of advances, but also just, you know, completely missing things on each of those levels and all the levels in between, which is, is really a unique experience, I think. When I've been reading up on Go strategy as best as I can understand it, there's this parallel between, like in chess, you have openings, and those have been very well established. There are books written about them, and people know certain openings are more popular over time, or maybe they wane, and, and there's all kinds of variations on those openings, and that's something that's really studied. In Go, I can't remember the phrase, but there's they're essentially jo- little skirmishes. Joseki. Joseki, right, where if you have pieces in particular arrangements it's been studied and there are hundreds of different variations of how that ought to be played out on the small scale and so the super experts seek to leverage advantage in much more subtle ways uh, whereas we're just trying to figure out those small scale yeah tactics, and, and, and i failed spectacularly and furthermore and again this is speaking from having read about it, not from understanding it, but also with the Joseki, they're kind of well-studied ways of playing the corners to get certain outcomes. Mm -hmm. And those are kind of known outcomes, but there's still, it's still worthwhile to know them because you might have a grander strategy purpose for pursuing one Joseki over another. Mm. So even with those known openings that you kind of know the outcomes, there's a surprising amount of kind of possibility space yeah the other thing that seems much more possible or it seems much more common in go than chess which would be my main comparison is tempo shifts i feel like in chess it's much harder to find a really good tempo play it seems like it's a much more contained battle whereas in go or maybe it's just because we're all kind of bad at the game but I'm finding myself very frequently considering it's like, okay, is it actually beneficial to keep continuing this line of play? Or if I jump to a completely separate side of the board, do I gain an advantage on this other fight that I wouldn't have had otherwise? Because since it's a game where you're just going back and forth, placing a single stone, getting that kind of momentum advantage, you know, the one stone momentum advantage in a particular fight can be huge especially if you're like the first one to force an opponent's stone to only have two liberties and then if they do something else you can put it in atari which means it only has one liberty and at that point they typically have to try to escape and race out and i find myself falling into traps where i don't protect that enough and my stones fall into atari a lot so that's been kind of my focus but the idea of like moving back and forth between these different skirmishes on the board and trying to gain tempo advantages in doing that is 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 neat. I, I really enjoy it. Yeah, I, sometimes I feel like I'm losing an area, and so it's just I just okay, I'm going to play somewhere else. Or sometimes I feel like I'm winning an area, and I just feel like okay, I'm going to just go play somewhere else. Yeah, and unfortunately, the the website we've been using to play this on allows you to what's it called Anal- analyze mode analytic mode or something it's called analyze game but analyze basically game. it just lets you play out different lines of i go here they go there i go here they go there i go here I go, they go there oh that doesn't work take yeah. it all back that's been super helpful because i have such a hard yeah. time imagining those structures getting formed so i can be like okay here 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 oh well, that's really bad <laughs> I, I love it when i go into analyze mode and i analyze 13 possibilities and then you just do something else oh yeah because it keeps the different trees of everything you've analyzed so you can kind of okay if they do this i can do this this and this and so it saves like different trees of, of lines of play and uh if they actually do one of the things you predicted you can 
go back in and, and kind of remind yourself of what the line was that you were trying to play out there, uh, which is very nice. I can't remember the name. It's like playgo. play dash go dot com. Something yeah, like it's, go I think it's com. abbreviated OGS, Actually, which is like online go system or yeah. I don't know. Uh, if good. you if which, you search which actually, online can go, I, can I mention? I, I created a uh, the thoughtful gamer group right oh, now. It's yeah. just like it's just like the four of us. But if if anyone wants to play Go, you don't have to be any good to play with us. <laughs> please, if you want to play with us, please be very bad like us. If you're very <laughs> good very at good Go, then you will not something. have a good time with us, and neither will we. <laughs> or if you're good, you could teach us something about or that. Play. Yeah. But you would probably find, at least me, my, my play very dull and stupid. Any other thoughts on Go, Orion? I mean, yes. But <laughs> I have so many thoughts about Go, and I don't know if any of them are really fully formed. Um, awesome. Throw them at us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll just start blurting things out. I, I've started playing a little more intuitively and trying to recognize this feels like a good shape. Mm. Um, and I think that's the area where I've started to improve in playing the game. That's probably slightly more on the strategic side of things in terms of looking at the position and saying, I think this is good for me, or I think I need to go this direction. And then the other area that I've definitely improved on is understanding tactically how to kill a corner position or something like Mm -hmm. that. And we i think we all did some of the beginner exercises mm-hmm. there's a there's almost a mini like not a course but a, a set of exercises that shows you different positions and says how do you kill in this position or how do you survive in this position and again like you mentioned it's all about forming two eyes to live or preventing the opponent from forming two eyes if you're trying to kill the position and i've pulled off some nice combos in that of saying okay i need to take the corner here because that forces you to form an eye there and then i can push in from around the corner and you won't be able to get two eyes and even though i'll lose a stone or two doing it i will destroy the whole corner and net points on the exchange Mm -hmm. another thing psychologically i find winning go really satisfying because it's like flexing on someone with your mind. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's an, ab- but that an abstract in general thing, right? Yeah, no, that that's definitely an, uh, yeah, that's an abstract thing in general. <laughs> um, and if you want to jump into chess, uh, a, a few months ago, was it November? I think November was the, uh, world chess championship being streamed from, I think it was in, uh, somewhere in England this year, maybe Norway. And Magnus Carlsen was defending his uh, title for the third time, and he ended up winning in tiebreakers. But watching the game, the two of them basically go into this glass box, and there's no technology, and there's no people in there. And it's just you and the opponent sitting at the board, and there's no hidden information, and there's no help from outside. Like, you can prepare ahead of time, but there's no outside help or anything else it's just you have to be better than the opponent and that is fascinating to me i don't know it's just it's very it, pure it's very pure and it's we, we think of go and chess as being like well these small white and black pieces being pushed around a board or placed in different shapes that don't really mean anything to an outside observer but it can be a brutal exercise because yeah There's nowhere to run and hide. You can't hide behind the story and say, well, I'm just going to explore a bunch, you know, or I'm going to try this thing. It's just, yeah, you win or you lose. And and chess, you draw a bunch, but (laughs) it's just you have to be better than the opponent over the board with these pieces. And there's no, there's nowhere to go. (laughs) In that sense, it's almost like sparring or something. Yeah. In, In comparison, like, I don't think many modern board games are substantially different in that regard, but they feel different. You know, if it's a little engine builder or something, a lot of the game is kind of played on your own. And yeah, your engine is being judged against other people's engines and you're interacting with them. But a lot of the feeling is you're you're kind of looking inward and, and trying to do your thing the best. And you can 
you can feel good about playing well, even if you don't win in a certain sense. That's, that's, that's fair. Uh, um, although I think maybe a psychological difference in that in an engine builder, you're building something up and generating right, points. Right. Whereas in these abstracts, if you're losing, you're generally actively getting destroyed and losing pieces. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, that's that direct my interaction. Point. I think, um, I mean, well, I mean, even in Go, you can lose and never have lost a piece. You just didn't effectively gain territory as much as the other person. Um, but yeah, I, no, I, I think we're at least closer, Ryan. That sense of building up can be rewarding even if you lose. And, and, and that's really stripped away in a game like Go where it's just a table and black and white pieces that you're placing down. Yeah, it certainly does have that kind of a unique feeling. And I, again, I talked about this in my in the review of TAC I just published, but it's also the aesthetic of it, I think. It's typically so simplistic and straightforward and, again, pure that it lends itself to that kind of serious, deep thinking where it's like, okay, we're doing something serious now. Whereas... You know, many modern board games, they actively try to get away from that feeling where it's like, okay, we're trying to make everyone to have a good time. And that's really the Euro game philosophy, right? It was built, it was made for families. It's games that everyone can get around. No one gets beat down. No one gets destroyed, but everyone sits around a table and has a good time, which is wonderful. But the, the very combative stately nature of these abstract games is to me equally interesting like Ryan said it's just absolutely fascinating to watch especially at high levels I know when you were getting back into chess a bit more you were watching Hikaru I can't remember his last name Nakamura Hikaru Nakamura is what top three in the U.S. he was the former U.S. champion he's slipped a little bit in that he is like 10th in the world or 14th in the world instead of being second in the world right like he was seven eight years ago i think but even then 14th in the world today is one of the best chess players of in history oh yeah yeah and, and you just you watch him and he's just mesmerizing to watch him play chess yeah you you were watching the stream of him playing i can't remember the mode but he was playing a, basically a bunch of blitz games over and over again for an hour yeah, he's been st playing and streaming this tournament called Arena Kings, which is you play blitz games, which means three minutes each person. And I don't remember if there's an increment, or if it's just straight three minutes, or if there's an increment. I think it was just straight three I think, minutes. Yeah, I think it's just straight three minutes. Uh, three minutes on for each player. And you play these games for two hours, and whoever has the most points at the end of it wins the tournament. But he's playing these blitz games against grandmaster level players and talking to twitch chat and commentating and explaining the different variations he's doing and he goes like 30 and one or something it was absolutely insane um and that one's a draw not a loss <laughs> like i i think his yeah he his the rec his usual record is something like 20 two draws, and maybe a loss in two hours of play. It, uh. it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And yeah, and he's absolutely. really chill about it, too. Like, he doesn't yeah. seem to be thinking that hard. He'll occasionally be like, oh, that's tricky, and I do this, and I win. <laughs> yeah. Occasionally, he'll stop and think for all of five seconds to find the solution. Yeah. It's it's mind-boggling. Muggling. And uh, during the the world championship he would come on the broadcast and commentate or um, whatever for an hour and the regular commentators who were like grandmasters themselves were trying to keep it was all they could do with just to keep up with him because he'd be rattling off these variations or lines of play faster than they could even follow yeah he's it's remarkable it's i think he's famous for being especially fast like that okay um i don't think that's his thing uh, I mean, the other so-called super GMs, which is like 27 plus ish, mm -hmm. uh, 2800 or so, can all just like look at a position and be like, oh, white's better or, oh, this is the right move or something. But I think he's especially known for that really fast play and thinking and so on. 
and I think he's he he might be only 14th in the world at classical chess, but I think he's like top three in bullet chess, which is one minute each side. Okay, because That's... he's really good at predicting and playing fast. Yeah. It's it's absolutely remarkable to watch, and I would recommend people look up his stream. He streams every day, right? Or nearly? Uh, he streams fairly often. I don't know if it's every day, but uh, he travels to some tournaments, but when he's at home, he streams often. Yeah. Regularly. Yeah. I was watching, I went on Twitch the other day, and chess. some chess tournament was on the front page, so I, I clicked on it to watch for a minute, and the very first thing I saw was this one game wrapping up. And, you know, it's like a physical, everyone's sitting at tables tournament and Hikaru's on the game behind them and he just gives them a dirty look as they stand up because like they're rustling, like broke his concentration or something. (laughs) It was very funny. And the commentators had a great time mocking him. He had some good facial expressions for sure. He's very expressive. He's my favorite chess personality at the moment. Oh yeah. He's awesome. But chess, chess is an interesting one because it is such an a cool game with some very clear flaws most notably how frequently top players draw nowadays like it's gotten to the point i i was looking at the stats i think 40 percent of pro chess games draw at this point is it that high yeah i think of the last like three years Okay. I know it's a lot. I haven't looked at the exact numbers. Yeah, which is unfortunate. And I know Bobby Fischer, before he went really crazy, really advocated for chess games that had that weren't just the standard setup. So there'd be like a, a randomized setup of the pieces at the beginning, which I wonder if he was kind of right in that. that that's where chess needs to go to kind of liven itself up. People have talked about that, especially during the, I'll keep bringing it up, the recent world championships where they drew all 12 games for the first time ever yeah i think the previous max there were eight draws in a row but this they just drew every game and then magnus won handily in the tie breaks which is rapid and so people were saying maybe the world championship should go to a rapid format where it's 25 minutes aside instead of 60 plus 40 or something Mm -hmm. Um, or whatever it is it's it's well over an hour Maybe is it like a hundred minutes to start, and then you get another fifty after so many moves or something? That sounds correct. Um, something like that, but it's uh, a lot more time. There's a lot more sitting there thinking for half an hour uh, to end in a draw. <laughs> right. Well, in, and at a certain point, if the draws kind of create more draws, because you know, if there's a high chance of a game of a given game drawing, you know, before it started, you know, just a game, there's a high chance it's going to draw. I think just psychologically, you may find yourself playing for a draw more often because, you know, if you do lose, getting a win is that much harder compared to a draw. Yeah, At some point, be. I think it kind of tips over a bit, at least strategically of, yeah, you'll, you'll from start like playing a match for the draw. Strategy yeah, point from of view. a match strategy point yeah. of view, the macro point of view. But anyways, uh, I'm very bad at chess, but it fascinates me, especially when compared to Go, just because there are some similarities just kind of in the way you talk about the game. They're both kind of, the the language surrounding both games is both kind of militaristic of, you know, in Go, you're talking about good formations and taking territory. In chess, you're talking about attack defense different different strategies captures yeah yeah. Yeah. but chess seems to be especially now that i've played go more chess seems to be so much more contained and small and it seems that very good play is just kind of figuring out the tiniest of advantages and leveraging that into a single piece advantage usually a pawn and then leveraging that into a win if you're going to win chess has changed a lot over the last say, 100 years. Mm -hmm. 100 years ago, someone like Capablanca would win just because he was better, and people would win a lot of games. Yeah. And more recently, there's been more parity in that there are more top players instead of, like, two top players in a given decade or, you know, a handful. There are now dozens, maybe not hundreds, but dozens of people who are above 2,800 or above 2,750. ELO rating, uh, Mm -hmm. of course, I'm saying. And also, 
computers have made a huge difference in chess, a huge impact, because the computer is almost always smarter than the human. Not only will the best computer beat the best human, but in a given situation, the computer will almost always find the perfect move and be able to rate them and say, this is the correct line of play. Right. So and the top players are back-checking their decisions against computers. Yeah. It's an incredible analysis and learning tool to be able to replay games and look at different openings and say, oh, this is actually a mistake, or no, that that's the right line because of this. And you can answer that question, whereas before you were limited by how much time you spent on it. <laughs> Yeah, And now you can have a, a computer run through, you know, 100 million variations and you can know, well, yes, this is better. Where instead of just kind of, I don't want to say you didn't know before because grandmasters could know what is good and what is bad. But you can more quantifiably say, this is how much this position is worth. Mm -hmm. And that has improved chess play in terms of how, I guess, correct uh, people play and fewer mistakes and everything which has again led into the situation or climate of having many more draws combined with more higher level players and better understanding of exact valuations of different positions it's ended up with more draws yeah talking about go with kind of the the tactical play and then trying to explode that out to leverage it for a greater strategic value chess has a different feel to me where there's kind of these distinct like beginning mid and end games and that seems to be built into the language right you have the openings you have end game play which is often a lot of pawns and probably one or two other pieces in the king uh and then everything else is seems to be just trying to leverage really good trades to get positioning for the end game, uh, which I find very interesting because just the way chess is, you have to, at some point, pieces have to trade. And it's not necessarily if pieces will trade, it's just when. And a lot of the strategy in chess seems to be using that inevitability and trying to use that inevitability to your advantage. Yeah, th there's a lot of different facets there is tactical play, which is a lot easier to practice because you can get tactical puzzles mm -hmm. and say, all right, white in three, and you have to figure out, you know, the combination. Or, uh, and sometimes it's to find checkmate and sometimes it's to win material. And those are great. They will help you be better at chess and find those tactical combinations. The slight flaw in them is that when you go into that puzzle, you have the meta knowledge that there is a play here and I just need to find it. Oh, that's true, yeah. Whereas in a game, you don't necessarily know that that's true. And so you can, again, it is helpful. Like, I'm not trying to say tactics is bad. They're very important. But it's not the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be able to recognize the position well, you're in. Yeah, well, t there's always a context that c tactics doesn't capture, right? Yeah. And and in sometimes, just in, in general, sometimes it's easier to distill a particular choice down to pure tactics. On one end of the spectrum is Go, where, at least to my knowledge, certainly for me, but I think in general, I think it is, it's very hard to distill a certain situation down to pure tactics. Chess it's a little more complicated. Is that is that the case, Orion? It's hard to say. There, there, there is th there is a grand strategy, or sorry, there is a, a bigger strategy of board position that you're trying to control in chess. But there are more instances where there are you know very clear kind of if I make this move, he makes that move. This happens, and then position on the board has changed in this way. There are more clear situations like that, even though there's always. A slightly bigger picture, even mm -hmm. for chess. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, it, I, it's probably fair to say that those tactical combinations are easier to isolate in chess than mm -hmm. in Go, and maybe that's because we are generally more aware of chess 
kind of socially, I think, at least in the Western world, than than Go. In Go, I I don't know if I agree with that. I I think it is a product of how the game is played, the the flow of the game. Don't you think that? Well, I, there's something else I wanted to bring in that may be useful here or not. One key difference between the two games is that one is based on moving pieces and one is based on placing pieces, right? Um, so there's you can never speed up Go. Go will always progress at at most one square per turn. It's not a it's a, it's not a perfect situation I'm describing here, but with chess, capturing a queen has a far greater impact on the game than than you know a stone can ever have in Go. Right, capturing a queen would be like capturing an entire corner or something. <laughs> Right, or, or right. half the board, or something. I don't know. It would be like it would be but, a huge play. Yeah, but sort of the lead up to capturing a queen would be so much kind of board state manipulation. A bunch of pieces would have to be, you know, protecting different squares, and you ha- the tactics of maneuvering your pieces around while not giving any of your pieces up, or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. The nature of that kind of maneuvering pieces lends itself to kind of a more tactical climax at least compared to go which uh maybe you could say that in chess there are more often dramatic exchanges than in go is almost always incremental yeah that might also be limited then or dependent on the experience of the viewer it's it's more clear to see a flurry of exchanges in chess would be like, oh wow, that was that was big and exciting. Mm-hmm. Whereas the impact of a particular place stone placement in Go for someone like us is, you know, if if experts get excited about it, I think it's unlikely that we will be able to see the implications and why that was exciting. It would need to be explained to us. Mm-hmm. So I think I think Go is is just going to be a bit more subtle in that way because. Like Matt's saying, no matter what happens, it's still just a stone placed. I mean, yeah, so certain placements will remove other stones, and maybe they remove a huge chunk, but that you're going to see ahead of time. Mm-hmm. The really exciting stuff feels a bit more subtle, I think. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. I don't know. I In chess, I really like the interplay between coordinating your different pieces to support each other and a strategic concept of attacking on the king side, for example. Whereas in Go, it's more about this incremental improving my position and forcing you into a corner that you can't escape from, or cutting off your liberties, or slowly building a shape that will survive. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas in chess, you're more often building to a more extreme exchange or attack or something like that although at higher levels you'll also see because they can recognize positions once they're once they know sooner that they've lost so a lay person might be like oh why why would you resign there and it might take them another seven moves or maybe not that many but some number of moves to realize oh that's why this is such an untenable position Mm -hmm. and i think in go that's just built into like every position of almost every position is obscured and i have a hard time calculating even a couple moves ahead whereas in chess you can see a forcing a line of play a very forcing Mm -hmm. line of play of saying well i'm going to force you to trade queens and then i'm going to exchange these pieces and then i'm going to exchange these pieces and then i'm going to win one pawn at the end of it and you can in, in some situations, you can force that whole line out because the alternative would be something worse. Right, yeah. And in Go, I generally am playing and I might say, I don't know about this position. I think I'm okay. And then I'll realize, oh, no, that position is lost and I need to just go somewhere else. Yeah. Or I've won that corner. I can move on. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, something I don't think we have mentioned yet is that very fundamentally in a game of chess, each side is going to be losing pieces as the game progresses and their presence on the board lessens. 
But in Go, it increases because all you're doing pretty much is adding stones to the board. I don't know if the implications of that are as severe as some of the more subtle distinctions in the game in terms of how the game feels. Both of them still feel similar in many ways. The attacking, the defending, the key positioning, forcing lines, trying to fork the opponent so that they, they're given two bad options and they have to accept one of them. All of that is present in both of the games, even though fundamentally on that level, they're they're different, like very, very different. In terms of what those sorts of things look like? Or what do you mean? Or just in terms of chess, you're destroying it and go, you're adding. Sure. Yeah. So I think the, the, key, the more key element of those games to create kind of the language and the feeling and the strategy of them is the two-player nature, the back-and-forth nature. I think when creates more of the feeling of that than the idea of adding or subtracting or moving or placing. Right. I think moving or placing or adding, subtracting are the where the games differ and they're similar in that all the other ways that we've talked about. Yeah, and I think the similarities are much stronger than than the the differences. In yeah. That case. I, I've yeah. tried to pull out some things of why I prefer chess. And then I'm like, well, that kind of exists also in Go. I just don't recognize it as much. I mean, frankly, they're both, you know, I think there's a reason they've lasted this long and that they're both incredibly compelling games. Mm -hmm. If I had to choose, I'd probably say Go between them, but I really enjoy playing chess also. So we talked about all these elements of Go and chess. I think they're completely interesting games. There are two others that we've played before and or these we played not even that much or at all i think in january just we played them before uh as examples of kind of modern takes on on abstract games and i say modern takes not just because they were created in during the kind of modern board game boom but because they specifically seem to draw elements from modern board games and apply them to the idea of an abstract game. And that's Santorini and Onitama. At the base of the game, they're they're pretty basic abstract games, but they both have this kind of modern board gamey twist to them. So Santorini adds in variable player powers, a very kind of a meritrashy thing, and it completely changes the game to a pretty extreme measures and of all the games we're talking about today i think this one's clearly my least favorite i think it can't sustain the wild swinginess of those player powers but the core game is somewhat interesting it's a spatial 3d thing where you're trying to construct these buildings and and get one of your two people onto the third level of one of the buildings you have two pieces and yeah. you can move one space and then build one thing and it's five by five grid i think i think so yeah and each space can have a building and each building can have up to four levels and they're all the same so the first level of every you know you place the first level of the building which is all the same in every any space yeah and that's where kind of the abstractness of the pieces are all the same and there's the no hidden information and the back and forth that that kind of comes in and you can start a new building or you can build up and then you can also jump up one level when you move and you can jump down as much as you want i think mm -hmm. so the the key strategies i've found are using two high buildings to kind of leverage to kind of box someone out of an area yep to where you can get a level three building there's also situations where you can fork the opponent is the other main way you want to do it because theoretically like you place you move and then you place a level three building and then they cap it with the dome which is the level four and then you can't you can't move on to a dome yeah because the movement has to come first movement has to come first and you win by moving on to the third level of a building so you have to be on a second level and then build a third level next to you, and then move on to it. You could also build it ahead of time, but then the opponent has more time to block it. So that goes back and forth, of course. Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, you weren't particularly thrilled about this one either. It was fine. Yeah. I didn't love it. 
my impression, and I'll do a review of it eventually. I don't know if I'll get to it this week, but but at some point I'll actually get to a review of it. It felt like when you're playing without the player powers, it felt a little too basic, where it was just back and forth kind of, okay, they put themselves in a winning position, then I just move and block it. And it was very difficult to actually win a game without the player powers. And then once we added the player powers, some of them were just seemed insanely powerful. It's also the combination. Certain player powers interact very differently with other player powers. Yeah. Um, I played this once with my sister, and I think I had the one that let you build an extra time, and she had the one that let you destroy a building (laughs) at the start (laughs) of your turn. So I would build up a tower, and she would tear it down. And we just kind of went back and forth and didn't really get anywhere for a while. (laughs) Yeah. What this does is it kind of levels the playing field a bit where to truly get mastery of Santorini, you got to analyze effectively like, was it like 15, 20 different games or or 20 different powers? Well, more um, than that. You have the, the combination of powers. Yeah, yeah. The, the combinations, if you factor that in, it's even more. So it's very much a game of recognizing how the powers are going to interact with each other and then try to gain an edge on that, which I think some people would find very interesting and entertaining. And I don't think it's bad necessarily. It just feels a bit frustrating to me or it's like, okay, I got to completely reconceptualize how, what I think of this game and try to figure out a way to win on the spot. Whereas a more traditional abstract game, it's very much a game of mastery, where the game's the same every time, it's just you who gets better or worse, or plays better or worse. And I think I prefer that over the more variable, randomized setup of Santorini. Is that only because it looks like an abstract game? Because I feel like there are other games that are very similar except for your starting player power. And yeah, yeah. those will cause very divergent or different combinations which affect the play a lot. Oh, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, I think it's because it's an abstract game. It certainly tries not to look like one. It actually looks really ornate, which in some ways is cool, but it's also kind of annoying fiddling with those big, chunky plastic building pieces. It doesn't I mean, look has, neat on the nice table. It has nice Ameritrash plastic towers. Yeah, it's, it's the game that creates, the. I think, a very... One of the most unique sounds when you shake the box. Because it's like all these plastic pieces, but they're large and hollow. Yeah, I think it's because it, it's an abstract game. That you want there to be more meat on the bone there. I think the there plastic isn't. also hurts the aesthetic of it. Because I think when you're playing Go or chess, it feels nice to have like this solid marble piece in your hand. Oh, or like yeah. a nicely carved wood piece or something. Yeah, And then in Santorini... You're playing these kind of weird hollow plastic pieces that yeah, clink together. Yeah, feels flimsy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I think from a distance it looks nice. When you're playing with it, it, it it loses a lot of its luster. The view of the game is cool over time as you play because the landscape generally goes up, mm-hmm. and so it. Uh, yeah. You start with a, a flat field, and then you end up with this 3D cityscape almost. Yeah. But the play, it's just. Like, in Go and Chess, there's so many combinations and ways to leverage position. And in Santorini, there's just not. Maybe that's the the fundamental thing. The basic game is just a bit too simple. There doesn't seem to be as much exciting strategic stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the variable player powers just don't help that. Mm-hmm. They just make it different each time. So maybe it's not the vari- variability that I have a problem with. Maybe it's just the base game. It's an incredibly fine l- line to walk to find something that is elegant, really. You know? You, oh, yeah. You veer, you veer just a tad to one side and it's just too simple. You veer too, too far to the other side and it's too complicated. Yeah, um, I, I don't I don't envy people who are out there trying to make abstract games. It seems like absolutely a very not, difficult yeah. design challenge. There's a feel like I want the variable setup to work. I never heard of that chess, you know, variable chess setup, but that sounds interesting to me. When we've been playing Go, I I even thought like this is basically a territory game. You know, could there be some sort of like 
terrain that you're playing on. Um, oh, man. You know, stones with special powers. I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure I'm people a, have done I, I, it. There's, I, I, there's certainly a huge group of people who do chess variations. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't know. That to say, I was a little disappointed that the, the variable powers in Santorini, that the game didn't pay off. But. Yeah. Whereas in Onitama, which also has a variable setup, I think it actually works pretty well. Oh, and I haven't played this one. You know what it, how it works, though, right? I don't. Let me look real quick. Oh, so or, it's... Or tell me. It's a game. It's it's very simple. I, th- I think it's also 5x5. Five five. It might be 5x4. Five 5x5. Five five. You have five pieces. Four of them are pawns. One is like the master or something like that. And it starts in the, the back row center. You win by either capturing the opponent's master or by moving your master to the opposite center space. Um, so the center space on the opposite wall. And each game, there are five movement cards randomly selected from, from the dozen to 15 that you're given in the base game. And they will show different movement patterns. Uh, so moving to particular spaces or like two ahead and two to the side, you know, different movement patterns. And on your turn, you choose one of the two in front of you, and you move a piece according to that movement pattern, and then you trade that card with the the fifth card in the center, and then now the card you just played is in the center, and your opponent does the same thing. So you are trying to manipulate what movement capabilities you have, but also, and oftentimes more importantly, what movement capabilities your opponent can have. And so it is variable, but it's still... Feels more even than in Santorini, where you could have very weird interactions. You know, you could hoard a card, but that also limits your strategic potential or your your, your the different potentials of of play. Yeah. So you're kind of going to see everything throughout the game. It's just thinking ahead in terms of what movements are available to you and your opponent, which I think well, I thought was pretty clever. So this is interesting in that the five movement cards that are selected, you start with two of them. So you do have different starting positions, but as the game progresses, you're both dealing with the same unique setup. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It ends up evening out. It, it Maybe that's mostly. a better way to approach variable setup in abstracts. Yeah, and it's also, again, a kind of a more modern take, not just because of the variability, but because it fogs a bit seeing the future. You know, like in... in Go and chess in tack even, which we'll talk about in a little bit. The barrier to seeing future lines of play is basically your skill level in your own mind. In Onitama, I feel like it's a bit hazier because what card your your opponent chooses to play splits like the possibility space. It branches it out really rapidly, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Whereas... You know, you get to a particular position in chess and it's like, okay, reasonably my opponent can probably do A or B and then you have two branches and then it causes this forcing exchange. Do I come out ahead? Like even for a beginner player, you can kind of, there's certain points in the game at least where it seems fairly simple to predict what plays will, will, you know, what will cause a a rapid succession of forcing plays or or at least semi-forcing plays. In Onitama, it felt a little bit more foggy, which I thought was an interesting way of kind of making it friendlier. I almost want to call this like poker crossed with an abstract, but I don't think it's really bluffing. It's more just you don't necessarily know what the other person is going to do. And also the things available for them to do will rotate. At the same time, your options are rotating. Yeah, it's, it had an interesting feel to it. It feels very much like a, a lighter, more refreshing abstract. And I think not just because of the smaller board. I think just because your choices, you don't, you have much, much fewer choices overall each turn. You know, you have two different movement patterns and then up to five, up pieces. To five pieces that can move. And then, you know, a third of those possibilities will just be blocked by the dimensions of the board. Or like Mm -hmm. where other pieces are. So it really rapidly narrows down what you can do on that turn. And then again, I think it's it fogs up really quick when you're trying to predict what will happen in the future. But as a lighter experience, I I quite enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy Onitama as much. I think I wanted it to be chess and it's just not. Because your pieces 
don't move consistently. And once you move a piece with this pattern, you don't get that pattern back for several moves. Yeah. And I think I went in trying to think about it like I think about chess in terms of building a position and setting up the sorts of strategic considerations in chess. And it's just different in Onitama because the moves rotate. Yeah. I think it's I think success in Onitama is much more about manipulating where the cards go over board position. Um yeah. As I played it a few more times and started to have success by just not allowing the opponent to do anything of just trying to build a wall, a no man's zone all the way across the board and slowly force them back. Yeah. Um, what and- I would always look for are are there particular movement spaces that are only available on one card? And then I would leverage that and maybe hold on to that one particular card and know that specific, you know, maybe one particular diagonal is now completely free for me to move on into and then try to get a position into the opponent's space using that. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I didn't like this one as much. Maybe it's because I lost the first like four games I played against you. And I'm too competitive to play that sort of abstract yeah, this game. Is, where this is the only abstract where I started out being good at it. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe maybe that's why I didn't like it, but it didn't grab me. I didn't fall in love with it, but I thought it was a, a clever little game. Though I haven't pulled it out since the review, so there's that. But the last one we've been Probably the best of these three. That the best of the modern ones? The best of the modern ones. Yeah, is Tack. Yeah. Um, and I think it's precisely because it doesn't try to be a modern game. It very much wants to be alongside chess and go and all the classics. And I think it almost succeeds. I would have to play it, it more. And I think people would have to play it more, but I think it's a valiant effort. After, it's a valiant yeah. effort. At, it's at least that. Yeah. It might be more. <laughs> yeah. I think our reaction was, I don't know if I like this game, but we both think there's something here. Yeah, that was our initial reaction, and then after playing it a couple more times, I really like it. Okay. And I'm interested in playing it more. The game I played with Matt the other day was really, really fun. Yeah, that was really fun. I, I'm seems... at the point where I feel like it could play itself out, but I'm certainly not to that point. It doesn't yet have the gravitas of, of these classic abstracts for me and i I don't think it will get there but i haven't eliminated that possibility yet my fear after our game is that too many games would end with the kind of stalemate win con rather than the checkmate win condition but in in my research later when the player who's behind recognizes it it feels like a good strategy to go into stalemate Right, but I, I looked up, I was looking up trying to find first player advantage statistics, and apparently online, it only ends with the the point win condition like 4% of the time. Okay. Which shocked me. So, read the review, uh, I j- just posted it before, this is Monday night, I talked about the game a bit more. Essentially, you're trying to construct a road with your pieces across the board on a 5x5 five five board as standard although you can play it with different sizes and tack. Uh, So you're trying to connect opposite sides of the board. You either place a piece or move a piece, and you can move on top of other pieces to create stacks, and then whoever has the piece on top of that stack can control that stack. And when you move a stack, you can pick up to five pieces from the stack, and you can move along a straight line, and you just have to drop off at least one piece each stop along the way. You can place pieces vertically as walls. They don't count as part of your road, but they do block movement. And they can move themselves. And they can move. And then you have each person has one capstone piece, which is kind of like a super wall. It blocks movement and can move, and it counts as part of your road. And? Oh, and it can flatten walls. Yeah. If it jumps on top of them, it smashes them down, and they are then roads. Tack has a couple very interesting dynamics. The choice of whether to place or move is just really cool as a dynamic in the game. Because when I first started playing Tack, I wanted to just place all the time. And that's kind of what we did. Well, it's like, clearly, we want pieces on the board. Let's just keep placing. And then you realize, wait a minute, 
if I move and just take over the spot, not only have I, you know, it's kind of just as good as placing because you've gained a place on the board relative to your opponent by making them lose a place, you now have control over a stack, which can have a little bit more influence over the board. And I think once you realize how important movement can be, you then realize, wait a minute, each of the spots that can be moved onto can be protected by having a, a friendly piece near that spot so it can take over the space after it's been moved into. And then the game gets really interesting. You can also set up the sort of exchange chains that we talked about in chess of I take, you yeah. take, I take, you take with yeah. these positions on the board of, well, I'm going to place into the center here. And if you jump on top, then I'll jump on top, then you jump on top, then I jump on top, and now I control a stack of five, which is really powerful. Yeah. Right. And this, so, they are a little more obvious, at least to a non-expert in tack compared to chess. But what, what's a little more obvious? Those chains of... What did you call them, Ryan? Exchange. Yeah, chains, chains of exchange are a little more obvious in, in tack. I don't know. Maybe that's just a beginner problem. In chess, I feel like they they're longer and more complicated. Well, in chess, um, you have to you have to consider much further reaching spaces. Tack is literally just the orthogonal spaces. Right, right. So my only point is like that is a tactic that I've used is you know trying to mm-hmm. make sure I stay ahead in the chain of ex- exchange for an important space. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not as hidden or or sort of deep strategy, I suppose. Well, that's something I'm really enjoying about Tack actually is that everything reading the state of the game seems to be a lot easier in Tack than in Chess and Go. Yeah, yeah. Which you know maybe you say oh that makes it not necessarily as skillful, but for someone who doesn't play any of these games remotely competitively, I found that very nice where I could look at a board and. You know, it still takes a little bit, especially once the game is developed, but I can get a decent understanding of where the power lies and what are the key spaces on the board. It's just easier to see that, I think, without a lot of practice. So for for new players, I think you have a much more rapid ascent up a learning curve with TAC, at least to get to a a place where you feel kind of competent, where that's... Well, you you can feel like you at least know where you stand in the game. You may not be able to figure out what a good move is. Right. um, But you can say, I think I am losing, or I think that is a problem. (laughs) Well, the difference is like, you know, I've probably played twice as many Go games, at least, over the last month than I have TAC. And in Go, half the time, I couldn't... I could give you some kind of reason maybe why i played a piece in a particular spot but most of the time it's like well it seems like it might be good uh especially when it's not directly in a tactical exchange in tack you know i'm playing half the games almost all my moves i can be like well i played there because of this and this and this so it seemed like a good idea it's Mm -hmm. just a little bit easier to get to the point where like okay that feels justifiably good it's a bit of a bit friendlier of a game in that regard though it does at least again for beginners it does have enough complexity that the mid game you start to really try to calculate like oh yeah what what (laughs) what am i running into or what am i overlooking here and how do i set up a favorable position for myself yeah yeah figuring out especially once the board gets really developed because the thing with tack is that It ebbs and flows in terms of the coverage of the board, but especially when you get towards the end game, or I think I was remarking to you, Matt, that attack seems like all beginning and end game because it very, very quickly gets to the point where there are these large stacks. And if you don't watch out, like one of those stacks can just, you know, someone lays it out, boom, 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 I've taken these three squares and now I've won. You have to very quickly watch out for tack positions, you know, the equivalent of of check in chess because they can happen very rapidly it only takes five pieces to go across the board and then yeah by the time you think you're in the mid game then suddenly there are like kind of multiple ways that attack could could form and that's why it feels like it goes to the end game so quickly because all of a sudden you're 
you're having to deal with kind of multiple ways that the game could play out very quickly. Yeah. At least that's what I found is, you know, maybe like in the first handful of turns, there's a very clear like I'm creating a path across the board here. But then a couple of turns later, then, you know, I have three or four conceivable ways across the board in two directions. Yeah. And so then, yeah, and that's where you just feel you're in the end game. And so, so much of it is kind of managing those really powerful stacks so that the end of the game doesn't all of a sudden befall when the other player moves a stack, taking three positions on the board and, you know, finishing a opening path. And the strategy, again, it, it tends to follow, like, getting yourself into a checkmate position, whatever the equivalent that would be in tech, follows a lot of the same things, same kind of ideas I see in chess games where... You know, you create forking situations where there are two bad outcomes and they just have to choose one. Um, in tack, you want to create like redundancies on your road. So if once you have two paths it could take and then maybe they can only block one of those and you can still create the path with the other redundancy. It's almost like kind of like pinning a piece in chess. I don't know. I guess it's closer to forking. If, if it's you're trying to threaten two pieces or two paths that would be a fork yeah yeah a, a pin is where you are attacking a piece and but they can't move it because there's a more valuable piece behind it right i guess there's no equivalent there but yeah the forking thing is I, that's certainly one way you beat me in a game of attack mm -hmm. i remember it was just like well oh, that wait, seems to be two... the beyond missing a play you almost have to do something like that yeah to force a win because otherwise yeah. if there's only well, yeah, one the, way for you to, <laughs> to make a road they'll block it right but i think the more common way of doing that is to have two stack threats you just literally had two paths out oh i see that you could take it either two stacks or a stack in two directions right yeah yeah yeah, because the stack the stacks can go between two and four directions. You you have flexibility there. Um, there's some just really clever things about you know, unlike chess where you're just moving pieces and each piece has a very particular way it can move. Go, you're just kind of slowly building territory uh, through the placement of stones. With tack, there's just really cool interactions with stacks that are incredibly powerful but they can be blocked by walls uh, it's it's on a small grid so it, it doesn't have kind of the immensity of go or, or the complexity of chess maybe but it fits a lot into such a small space i agree and it it works beautifully with the source material. You haven't read the book, Matt, but... I haven't, no. I mean, one of the pieces are called Standing Stones, and if you read it, the King Killer, King Killer Chronicle books, you know that those are very important. The idea of just roads are, is very important to that book series, and just the way they presented the game. Like, the version I have has one side with the Celis or Celis flower, which is an important part of the main character story or the other side just has makes it look like a wooden board and it's called the tavern board the idea that it'd be just one you find at a random tavern they did a lot of work to make it feel like it was a game that was part of this fantasy world that it was something that kind of naturally grew out of that world like chess or go or any of the other ancient abstracts we've been talking about and i think they succeeded and then you can get really elaborate wooden or stone boards for attack. Other companies have created such things. I think it's a it's a good game for that. It looks very nice. I like the the visuals of it. You know, it, it, it's vertical. It has a verticality to it, which is cool. I'm really enjoying tech. I guess the only th other thing I wanted to talk about is just like I find the commonalities with these games is such a cool dynamic of very much this battle of skill and battle of wits just the idea of like sitting across from someone you have this medium in front of you this this play space that's elegant and defined and it's just all there like orion was talking about and it's just your brain against theirs to be so compelling even though i'm very bad at almost you know maybe all of them but onitama that dynamic and that intensity to the game is something we don't see in modern design and oftentimes for very deliberate reasons but on occasion i really really do enjoy it and i'm, I'm glad we've been playing so many abstracts this month uh one other thing that 
we have hinted at a few times, but I wanted to bring up explicitly is the idea of lines of play, which is something fairly unique to abstracts, or Mm -hmm. at least most characteristic of abstracts, of that you're looking at some position and you're considering a move and then a follow-up move and then a follow-up move and so on. And you're weighing these different lines and then variations of, you know, I do this, you do this, I do this, and then what if I do that? And then, or what if I go there instead? How does that shape the situation on the board or shape your response or force you into something or help my position or, or so on? And there's a lot of that calculation back and forth. And honestly, the game is almost who is better at that that ex- that back and forth and yeah. skill i think skill in these games is measured in pattern recognition slash position analysis mm-hmm. and how far into the future you can calculate the lines of play because if you can see farther you will find a better outcome <laughs> yeah i don't know if that's necessarily unique to abstracts but other games you know modern board games put up these barriers to how much people are able to think down that path right if you have a randomizing element all of a sudden you have this obstruction and then anything past that point becomes probability analysis instead of this kind of clean branching tree yeah there's very little to none probability analysis in these i mean games. the only I mean, probabilities up for for thinking about is just the probabilities of your opponent doing a particular thing over another decision yeah right and that and that really is just your ability to play skillfully from their position right yeah yeah so again it's the purity of it like everything's right there and there's no hidden information yeah and there's in i think all the ones we've talked about well, at least Go, Chess, th- there's no randomness. Mm-hmm. And the other ones have extremely limited randomness, if anything. I mean, Santorini and Onitama only have randomness on the setup. Right. Once you get to the setup, it's it's gone. Yeah, it's a really cool dynamic. And, and that super high skill cap, again, is, is against what we see in a lot of modern game design. And I don't necessarily want to play a game that's like that all the time, or even most of the time. But I found, having played a lot more abstract games this month, that it's actually very, very fun to challenge yourself mentally in that way. So if you're a person out there who doesn't necessarily like this kind of game, I would suggest give it a shot. Try to try to expand how you can think about games by, by playing a game that forces you to be the only impetus for your own success. You know, because so, so many games, and I think rightly so, kind of reduce the impact of skill through randomizing elements, through catch-up mechanisms, which are all great and fantastic and create great narrative experiences, but an abstract game can create an equally compelling narrative experience and one that can feel particularly rewarding, especially if you if you can feel yourself improving or getting better or making a play that surprised you that like wow that was actually a good play that feels really cool like earlier today like we we were playing through one of our games of go and i think i won that tactical exchange and i surprised even myself on the bottom part of the board yeah it exchange it surprised me because for the for most of it i was like i'm pretty sure i boxed you out and i'm going to win this yeah and then you played one move and i was like wait i've lost <laughs> yeah so i uh, that's the first successful thing i've ever done in go and it felt very nice i think i lost the following t- exchange but it doesn't matter we'll try to figure it out and, and improve it's, but, it's but a that, path of self-improvement it's, yeah it's very fun um, and because of the platform i was able to go back because i was like where did i go wrong right because you can have that discussion and say every move there I controlled every move that I made. I was not right. compelled to do anything. I didn't roll a die to see where I placed or anything. I chose to go there and I lost. And I know I didn't start losing, but 15 moves later, I've lost this area. So what did I do wrong? And I went back and I found a move that I think was incorrect. Yeah, it was really cool to look at that because when you showed it to me, I looked back and I was like, oh yeah, that was the mistake. 
and it was like it's so it was subtle. a situation where it was so subtle because it was a situation where you had a very obvious like you were on the attack and you were reducing the liberties of of one group of stones that I had. Mm-hmm. And so you had three, in terms of liberties, you had like three roughly equal places you could go that would reduce one of my liberties. Mm-hmm. And one of them was just better because of an ex- because of a sequence that would end like six moves later. Yeah. And that is something in Go where, at least for me, the impact of a move is obscured in, ter- in that I can't figure out why it's good. And I... I'm starting to develop an intuitive sense in some situations that this is a good move or this is a good concept or this is the right side to play on to try to attack a group. But in that situation, I was just, you know, I was just wrong. <laughs> yeah. And, and that experience, I think that kind of feeling of, of kind of overcoming yourself is something that abstracts can give you more than any other kind of a game. And to me, that's that's what's making them special to me as I play them more. Even though most of the time I choose a different game, but improving at something so clearly just through practice and thinking about it feels wonderful. Well, I think that wraps up the podcast for today. That was a really fun discussion, and I will certainly be playing and reviewing more abstracts, even though we're moving out of abstract month into smallish two-player game month. I don't have a great title for it, but... We'll have another podcast in a couple of weeks talking about those kinds of games and a lot more reviews of those kinds of games. But thanks for listening to this one. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. Don't forget to check out all the reviews at thethoughtfulgamer.com. And again, if you would like to watch our podcast being recorded live and get in on our very fun Discord server, as well as all kinds of other fun prizes and bonuses and things like that, go to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer thanks for listening everybody we'll talk to you all again soon goodbye goodbye bye